everybody. Um, I'm going to divide the talk um, into two areas. Um, first of all, for those of you who don't know Benchmark, I'm just going to do a quick overview of the company, um, and then we can fill in more detail perhaps as I go through the, some of the slides um, and in questions afterwards. If you've got any questions that you want to you know, get to more detail, and we can we can do that. Um, but I know there's quite a few familiar faces here. Uh, people have been to um, hear us talk about the company um, before, so I'm not, I'm not going to dwell too much um, on the overview of the company. I'm going, and then the second half of what I want to talk about this evening is really an update on some key areas that um, we think um, are important and that our investors are telling us through our comms um, route that are areas that, that are of interest to them and that um, we should communicate more on. So I'm going to pick up on those three areas. Um, so, what is Benchmark and what, what are we about? We've been around for, um, it seems like quite a long time, but a relatively short period of time. We were really founded in the late 90s. Our mission is all about building a sustainable food chain. We, we uh, the company is populated very heavily with scientists, technologists who have um, a shared vision about what needs to change in the world. Um, and we see the food, the food production as the key starting point. And there's a number of key reasons for that. Um, the food chain, it may, it may not seem like it to, or to us always here in the, in the West or in London, um, but the food chain is, is, has really needs to be addressed, um, that, and that need has never been more urgent than it is today. That we are faced with some profound challenges. Um, you know, we have tremendous growth. It's a cliche everybody knows that the world's population is going to grow to nine billion or more um, in a very short period of time by 2050, um, and that um, we're still in a world where a huge number of those people work in aquaculture and, and a great many of them actually that is all they do, they feed themselves um, but you've got massive movement into cities um, everywhere in the world, I've just come back from China where there are more, there are there's supposedly 15 at least cities that no one's ever heard of with a population of more than 5 million and I've been to some of those myself and, the, and some of them are growing at an incredible rate and that's changing everything for us as, as food producers. Um, and in order to address those challenges, we've got to double the amount of food we produce in a very short period of time from the same um, basic resources. Um, and we are, in doing that, we are having to meet this challenge without some of the tools that we may have been relying on through this first period of growth in food production. Um, so, for example, the use of crop treatments, pesticides, and even antibiotics in, in animal production um, are causing considerable greater concern all the time, increasing concern, and farmers are having to work out how to produce more food, twice as much food, um, with, less of these, with less use to these tools. This is a tremendous challenge, producing the, the food that the world needs sustainably without consuming more energy, and bearing in mind that the food industry is the largest polluter on the planet and it's the largest consumer on the planet, the largest consumer of energy on the planet, um, is, that's an incredible challenge. We've got a, we've got a, um, and a, we have a very short period of time to do that. And the, it's a challenge that's very complex, multi, multifaceted. There are many problems that face us which are inherently interrelated. And most of those problems are either um, only partially resolved or, com or, com or totally unresolved. Um, and the, 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 those problems out there, things like disease, um, the availability of nutrients, um, the changing weather patterns, um, have a profound effect on the cost of production. And we see that all the time um, in front of us. But the king, coming to the, uh, the point really from Benchmark's point of view, is back in the late 90s when we formed the company, we, could, we came to the conclusion that nearly all of those problems 
had one fundamental core, which was the biology, the basic biology that drives progress. And that's the work of, of our company. Um, and we are different in one way, or different in a way, in, in that we are willing to challenge the status quo. Um, I think those of you who know us um, will, have, will have already kind of worked that out from our, from our basic approach. So we're not um, frightened of going after innovation, going after discovery, looking, looking in places where other people maybe wouldn't look to find the answer to some of these problems. And we have a team of um, scientists, technically minded people, um, highly motivated, highly driven people who um, are using that knowledge of biology um, to drive progress. And we have a kind of driving dr axiom behind all of this, which we call the three E's. We say that sustainability is really made up of three core components. Um, there is ethics, things like food safety, um, human welfare, animal welfare. There's the environment, our interface with the environment, our consumption of energy, the, the amount of pollution we put out, the effect on farmland, in, ecology, and so on. Um, and the, the, in those areas is where the change is going to take place, but we can't uh, make that progress unless we are economically successful. Um, and that has been one of the interesting things, that the pursuit of sustainable production in everywhere um, has been proposed and promoted by governments and lobby groups um, and legislators around the world and yet not much progress really started to take place until business got involved so the profit driver um, is the key um, catalyst of change Get this right in a minute um, so what do we do in this work you know that there is um, that there are some so uh, we're in, in, this, in this respect, we're not too uh, atypical. We have manufacturing, so we make products. Um, but we have our own manufacturing capability. I'm going to talk some more about that. Um, we innovate products. Um, we develop products in-house with our own research and in collaboration with others, universities, centers of excellence around the world. Um, we also provide services. We are a huge believer in the delivery of technical service. In the modern world, most of us actually know this through our own interaction with devices and mobile phones, computers and the like, that it's actually great benefits to come from technological advances, but you need training. You need to be shown how to get the best out of these new innovations. Um, and we are great believers in providing technical service to our customers. Um, we think it's an important component of our business. We also believe in knowledge. Um, we're expecting people to change the way they do things, um, in order to take advantage of the products that we produce. Um, and uh, in order to help them do that, we believe in disseminating knowledge. Um, and that sometimes means that we're talking openly about things that others maybe wouldn't be willing to do. Um, but we find that that is actually a, a, a valid way of making progress. And of course, research. The company spends um, a considerable amount of our investors' money on research. Um, that is one of that was one of the key things that we when we IPO that we came to market we said we were going to use this money to drive research we knew where we were going to go very often um, we, we knew that there were programs in animal health in vaccine development and the like um, and we knew roughly what it was going to cost um, over a prolonged period um, and we knew that we needed to um, deploy that effort over a long period of time in order to create the opportunity through the new products to make change happen and to build the company whilst we were doing that. Our core markets. So those are, those, that's the, those are our operational structures. Where do we deploy those? Um, well, obviously animal protein is a, is a key area. Um, I think everybody knows that. Um, seafood consumption is increasing rapidly. Um, it's driven by a number of fundamental factors. There is the awareness in the Northern Hemisphere of seafood's role in health. Um, it, everybody knows that eat more fish is a very healthy thing to do. Um, and that's driving demand in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, we have another fundamental driver of demand, which is the emergence of greater wealth and a new middle classes. And the first thing that people <coughs> want to do when they have a little bit more wealth is to feed their families better 
and very often in the southern hemisphere these are fish eating cultures so they want to eat more fish and that's happening at a time as you can see from this graph here where the um, wild capture here in London is actually level uh, at best and there are those of us who believe that it's going into a period of long-term decline. So all of that new fish that we, that we need to produce for, for the world's population is going to come from here, from aquaculture. And you can see the rate of growth that's taking place in aquaculture. Um, and this is new species being cultured. You know, we never cultured salmon until 30 odd years ago. We never cultured shrimp in any great quantity until 20 years ago. There are new species coming all the time, sea bass, sea bream, turbot, grouper, seriola, yellowtail, tuna, getting closer. All the time there are new species coming out that, that most people think come out of the sea but actually are being farmed in aquaculture now. And that's what's driving this phenomenal growth. Um, aquaculture grows at around 6 to 8% per year, every year, has been doing for decades now, um, and is set to continue. It can't not continue. And that's a huge opportunity for us. And people maybe don't always realise that most people know that 70% of the world's surface is covered by water, but only most people don't realise that only 2% of our food comes from there. Um, and that's a dynamic that we've got, we've got to change, and there is a huge opportunity to change for us. And companies like ourselves, working in the technology behind that change, are the ones who are going to benefit from that growth. So we have um, a, um, a very powerful market that's growing all the time. We've already overtaken beef. Farm Fish overtook beef a few years ago. It will overtake all the others. It will overtake poultry, this huge market around the world for poultry, and it will overtake pork as well. Um, so we are, it's, a, it's a massive challenge, um, fun fueling that growth. It's, it's already in more than 250 species that are cultured around the world, and each one of those species has its own technical challenges, its own nutrition, its own disease picture, um, that all has to be worked out. Um, and, and again, that is the work of our, of our company. <clears throat> so we, we realise value um, by providing products and services <coughs> urgently needed today. So we have industries that ca where their growth is absolutely constrained by some of the factors that we're working on, like the shrimp industry, which at the moment is one of the biggest aquaculture species. We produce about 5 million tonnes of shrimp a year in the world. Um, but that growth is massively constrained by diseases. Um, and our company is right in the heart of working to solve those, those challenges. Um, and so we are producing the products and services that urgently need today, but we're also investing in the capacity, the, the ability to make these products, and the technology, the new innovations, to, to keep solving the problems that we know are coming tomorrow as we advance with these new species. And there's a lot of areas that are being covered. You know, there are, as I say, new species, there's new raw materials, um, this thing, insect <coughs> culture here, growing flies on waste and taking the larvae. They're actually very nutritious. They're high in high quality oil and protein um, and they can replace fish meal. Um, there's the culture of, of um, algae. We have our, our own very interesting algae business based in Belgium um, where we were the first people to freeze dry diatom algae um, and this is a very important energy source for aquaculture because these uh, microalgae, the diatoms, take energy from the sun and they soak up pollutants, otherwise pollutants, nit nitrogens and the like from the water um, to produce a very good, very valuable food source for the fish that are being cultured in that environment. There's new culturing te equipment technology coming, there's new nutritional approaches um, and, of course, again, right in the heart of all of this is genetics. Um, as we lose some of the resources in medicine, like um, antibiotics, like antiparasiticides, um, we are having to replace those with new tools, and genetics is pro proving to be one of the most uh, important areas for us going forward. Benchmark is <coughs> around 900 people. Um, we just completed an acquisition in Colombia, which I think has pushed us up to about 900 and something people. Um, we operate in 24 countries. 
um, ourselves. We have operations in 24 countries, and we sell products in more than 70 countries all over the world, North and South, south Hemisphere. Um, and alongside the development of um, new technologies, research in new products, we're also developing the ability to um, <clears throat> drive research harder by having our own research capability. Because aquaculture is so new, very often the facilities that you need to develop um, to new products and, and new technologies just aren't there. Um, and we recognised this um, sometime before we IPO'd and we acquired this. This is one of our sites. This is up on the west coast of Scotland. This is the Arto Research Facility. And we've been investing in that. We've converted that. This is now a drug trials, vaccine trials unit, um, which is second to none in the world. Um, and these, these facilities are manned by highly expert people. They're nearly all graduate biologists that work in, the, in, the, in this kind of environment. We also are developing new technologies. Um, some of you may have seen in the press some of our um, new products that we're bringing forward. Uh, very recently we announced that we'd um, got a new program working on a horse vaccine. Um, that's quite interesting because it's a big market, but the most interesting thing about it is the technology that's behind it. This is VLP technology or virus-like particle technology. These are vaccine antigens. So the active ingredient inside the vaccine, the thing that makes the animal immune to the disease, um, is a protein construct, a biological construct, that looks exactly like a virus to the animal's immune system. Um, this, this is a kind of leading edge technology. This technology was developed at Oxford University for cancer research, and the first human anti-cancer vaccines are VLPs. Um, the uh, cervical cancer vaccine that's been a great success is a VLP. We took that technology, licensed it for um, animal health, um, and we have now about nine new <coughs> vaccines um, in various stages of development. This one's actually quite advanced, um, and they, some of them have very big markets. This, the horse vaccine cures a problem called sweet itch, which is a very big problem in horses. Horses, anybody who's a horse keeper will have heard of it or had horses with it. Um, we have one for dogs called CID which um, cures a skin disorder. We have um, the quite well-known hypercat vaccine, which is um, in development, which um, vaccinates the cat to stop it producing the allergen that causes allergies in people. Um, so that's quite an interesting one. We have five or six aquaculture ones and another couple of um, farm animal vaccines that all come from the one technology platform. Um, and that's just one of five new technologies that we're working on in the vaccine arena. We recently launched um, our first sea bass vaccine. Um, it's a big market, actually, sea bass. Most people eat sea bass quite regularly these days, not just when they're on holiday in the Med. Um, most of it's grown in the Mediterranean, um, and it's um, a, a growing market. Um, it's a 300 million business today and growing fast. Um, and we, we launched a new vaccine, which is the first vaccine to cure a, a disease called nodavirus, um, which is having a big effect, a big improving effect on the Mediterranean sea bass industry. So that leads us into more about the pipeline. It's a key area and I know it's an area that investors are interested in because people ha ask themselves how much value have Benchmark got in their pipeline. And this slide is, is designed to give you a feel for what's going on in the pipeline. These days, of course, since the acquisition, of Inve, we now have three pipelines. We have our animal health pipeline, we have our advanced nutrition pipeline, and a breeding and genetics one. And we break them up into the various stages, pre-proof of concept or discovery, that's the kind of pure research stage. Um, scientists working in a lab somewhere, coming up with ideas that might work and testing those out. And then we have the past proof of concept stage, that's when a, when a, a product has been shown to do what you're wanting it to do, to cure the disease typically, or or to effect the change that you want it to, to, to effect without damaging the animal. Development trials, that's getting ready for licensing. In regulatory, that's when you're actually in the licensing process going right through to receiving the licensing or the mar marketing authorization and then we now, declare, we now start talking about new sales being achieved. So this pipeline shows you that uh, across those various areas we have um, 80, 91 products um, and a value of 
um, 700 and what is it today? 758 million. Um, and the way we calculate the, the value is we take a percentage, a growing percentage of the of the products um, value in the market once it's achieved its MA. So when it's in this, when it's pre-proof concept, it gets zero percent. When it passes proof of concept, it gets 15 percent, and so on. So we, we accrue more value as it moves through the pipeline, and we estimate the the the, um, the value of the product in our pipeline like this. Now I'm pretty sure that there's virtually no investors anywhere who put 758 million as a value against our pipeline. So you know we and in a way you could say, well, do we expect do we expect investors to do that? Well, maybe not. But I think one thing's clear: when you've got 90 odd products in development, you're not going to fail with them all. Um, and I think it's also clear that you're not going to succeed with them all either. So you have to, you know, come up with a, a some way of conservatively valuing it. Um, but I think our approach is to have a multi-product pipeline, and that way you defray the risk. You know, a lot of biotech companies like ourselves will have one core product, and if that fails at somewhere along the line in this process, they vir they're virtually no, they virtually have no value. Yeah. Um, can you give an idea how far each of those covers is from turning green? How many years away? Well, with vaccines, it takes from here to here between five to seven years, typically. But there are some. We are working on one. We've been working on one since 2007, so that's nine years, and it's just gone into the proof of concept stage, so it can be longer than that. Um, then there are, with drugs, it's much longer than that. With drugs and, and pesticides, it's 10 years probably of work. Um, and um, the animal health, the, sorry, the advanced animal nutrition products are much shorter, um, and they don't tend to have a regulatory phase. Um, so they're three to five. Um, breeding and genetics, five, six years. So you, it's it's a quite a long intake of breath. Um, and it's and we've been, of course, we started work on this pipeline. Um, long before we IPO, so many of the products that we have in there are quite advanced, as you can see from the from the diagram. Another um, area that I wanted to update you on this again is something that we report that we uh, discussed when we IPO was the development of our manufacturing base. Um, we stated that we were going to um, invest heavily. In our, in our vaccine manufacturing plant. We are one of the few companies in Europe with a animal health um, GMP plant, um, you know, a licensed plant to make animal vaccines. Um, there aren't very many of us. Um, and we've just completed an investment in our antigen suite, which makes us, without doubt, the most advanced in Europe, probably in the world. And that plant looks like a human vaccine plant. We could make human vaccines in here now. Um, it's, you know, it's the identical equipment, the same technologies that are being uh, deployed. And we, we had to do that because the new technologies that, that have the ability to create breakout, breakthrough innovations uh, are totally different. They are biological constructs. We are actually manufacturing proteins and putting together like mini uh, pieces of, of uh, tissue in a way, or growing tissues in new, new environments. We're using all the biotech tools that are, that are coming through now. Um, and so this plant has been designed to give us the capability to make all of these new um, types of products. Um, and it's just been finished building, it cost us a little over 16 million to build. We built it on the site at, at the Braintree vaccine plant. Um, we're just in the com commissioning and validation phase. Um, we're coming to production early next year. Um, in breeding and genetics, we're investing again in new technology. Again, this is technology that often comes from the human pharmaceutical medical arena. Um, so <coughs> genomic tools were invented for understanding why one person's genes make them more resistant to diseases than another's. And we use those tools in animals to understand what genes individual animals are carrying so that when we make them together, we can be accurate in selecting the traits that we want. Um, and we're also making, um, making so that we can produce year-round um, in totally biosecure, land-based systems. Um, and this is one of our farms in Iceland in the lower picture. And the drawing on the, on the top is um, a new farm that we're building in Norway. We recently raised some money um, to do that, to increase our capacity in Norway. 
demand for our products. These are advanced products. We're the first people to use genomic tools in, in aquaculture species. Um, and that's driving demand for our products. So we're, we're looking forward <coughs> and predicting growth. Um, so we're inc increasing capacity and we're securing, increasingly securing the production base. Um, and so, um, you know, this is again a feature of, of what's going on inside Benchmark at the moment. And of course, everybody knows that we raised a lot of money and we completed a very large acquisition of InBay Aquaculture at the very last day of last year. Um, this was to give us, was to complete our, our, um, our gearbox. You know, we, we see ourselves as a, as a gearbox to the engines of production, so we provide the, we're the gearbox that provides the technology that lets major producers produce more efficiently, more sustainably, um, at lower cost, at higher quality. Um, and we needed a high-tech, um, early-stage nutrition company to be part of that. Um, and Inve also had massive um, penetration of the key world markets, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, which we could put together with Benchmark's penetration of the Northern Hemisphere aquaculture markets to give ourselves a unique position. Um, how's that going? Um, it was a big acquisition. Um, so we are, we are quite well into the integration process. We have a very formal process um, that's been running. Um, the company is performing. Um, and the synergies that we saw when we first looked at this are starting to come through. Um, we were actually realizing some of those now in revenues. We're putting together, we're restructuring our teams to take advantage of those opportunities. And I've just come back from China. Um, and uh, what I was looking at there were some very major new opportunities for the combined company that we can get after, which we couldn't have done as, as separate uh, individual companies. So that side of the business is progressing really well. Um, we've also brought in from Inve um, a key accounts based system. So most of our customers these days, probably 80% of our business is in the hands of 50 companies um, around the world. And, we, and to reflect that, we're changing the structure of benchmark as we've got bigger um, so that we focus very, very hard on those key accounts. And this was something that Inve had already put all the systems in place in their business and we're now bringing that across the whole of the benchmark business. So that's a big initiative for us. Um, and we're getting the products, each other's products, into each other's distribution networks. That, again, is a very interesting process. Um, and it's been highly welcomed by our customers around the world. Um, it's been very uplifting for all of us working at Benchmark to go out and meet customers and tell them about the, the change. And they, they have been incredibly welcoming. We've actually we reached a point where we have a list of people who want to see us who we can't quite get to them all. Um, because people can see the potential of the, of the new company. So it's been very uh, an exciting era for us. And I would summarize by saying that the integration of Inbay is going well. And lastly, again, some of you have noticed in the press that we recently bought um, a, a company in Colombia um, called uh, Seniaqua, which we've renamed Genetica Spring. This is one of the world's leading shrimp breeding companies. It brings into our um, toolbox, the, the third major aquaculture species as a genetic species. Um, and shrimp genetics has a very powerful role to play in the development of the shrimp industry. The shrimp industry is groaning under the weight of disease challenges and breeding resistant shrimp is a really important uh, solution to that problem. And Genetica, uh, the Genetica Spring has got the longest standing shrimp breeding program in the world. We know all about it because we run it. We, did, we were contract geneticists. We ran the program, the genetic side of the program. Um, it was set up originally by the Colombian government to supply Colombian shrimp farmers. And they faced a very particular set of disease challenges, which meant that managing disease was a key criteria. And so we ran that program for 18 years. Um, and when the Chinese and the Asian markets and other markets, Mexico, um, other markets in Latin America, Brazil, started to go down with these diseases, we knew that this program had the capability to bring the answers. Um, and so we moved um, just after, immediately uh, around the time we finished the Inve acquisition, we moved to acquire this company. Uh, we completed that in August, um, and we're busy now integrating the, the new shrimp breeding business into, into the benchmark business. Um, and again, I have a list of customers ringing us up 
wanting to know when we can go and see them and talk to them about this. Because they, again, can see the opportunity, put the benchmark technology behind the Genetica Spring uh, core breeding program, and you have an incredibly exciting opportunity. So again, it's something that we're all very excited about, um, and that we think um, is a, it was a very cost-effective investment for our, for our investors.